So let's have a look now at how we can emit smoke from a moving source. And to provide a moving source, I've got a sphere here, which I've animated along this uh, sort of circular path. And we can see it moving around there. That takes 70 frames to get around the path. I'm going to switch off the display of the path, which is a bit confusing. So in order to emit from this sphere, I'm going to need, first of all, a fluid container. So let me just control click this smoke container, which places a smoke container at the origin. And now I want to emit from the sphere. So I'm going to select the source from volumes tool, select my sphere, press enter, select the fluid box and press enter again. And let's see what we've got here. We've got our sphere has been converted, as we can see, into a, an emitter. We can see that's now a volume. And we've got our smoke container here. And let's see what happens as we scrub through. Well, we can see that we're not getting any smoke emitted and that our smoke container is reduced back to a very small box at the origin. Well, in order to understand why that's happened, we need to take a, a bit more of an in-depth look at the resize container node here. Let me lay out this network. So the function of the resize container node is to ensure that our smoke container always contains uh, the smoke that's being emitted uh, up to, in general, the maximum dimensions set here. Now the problem we've got in this case is that we may have quite a small amount of smoke being emitted here but because the sphere is moving, it, it's going to go through a large amount of space. So potentially, you might need a very, very big smoke container to contain all of the smoke that's being emitted. Well, there are a couple of other approaches. One of them is to use instancing. We're not going to cover that in this tutorial. The other is to make sure that your smoke box smaller, follows your source around. And if we have a look at our resize container node here, it has two tabs, bounds and max bounds. So the max bounds, sorry, the bounds tab allows you to determine the relationship between the current smoke that's in your simulation and the size of the bounding box. So in this case, it's saying there's a padding of 0.3 around any smoke that exists. And we can also uh, include some parameters here, which allow you to decide what counts as no smoke. In this case, we're counting a very small number, 0 0.005, as no smoke. So if we had a container that was full of very, very light smoke uh, that was less than this number, then from the point of view of the resized container, that would look like there was no smoke and the container would reduce in size. And we can set the field here, which is going to be used to determine the size of the container. In general, uh, density is the field that you want to use for the resize container operation. We'll talk in a minute, perhaps, about this tracking object tab. So this is really just determining the relationship between your expanding smoke and your container. The second tab here is looking at how your container moves and what its maximum bounds are. And by default, it's set to this, uh, this uh, method in initialization static. And initialization static just means uh, that it sits in one place and it grows as your smoke simulation grows up to the size that's been specified here in your smoke object. There are a number of other ways to specify the size. We can specify it from an object, in which case the maximum bounds won't be drawn from here, from these numbers here. They'll be drawn from some external box that you set up in SOPs. Uh, there's initialization dynamic, and this is what we want in this case. Initialization dynamic allows you to take the dimensions, in this case 5 by 5 by 5, from the dimension set up here in your smoke mode, but it takes the position of the uh, maximum bounds from a moving object. So in this case, of course, we want to 
have a look at our sphere. Uh, and let's just rewind. So we should now find that this is working. But you can see it's not, uh, the, the box is still not tracking our sphere. And the reason for that is the two have to overlap uh, to start with. So we do need to move our box so that our emitter is inside it. Let's just see whether that's, that is now inside. So what we should now find is that as our sphere moves, and we can deal with this in a moment, uh, we can see that it is dragging the box behind it. Well, we see we've got a problem here because at a certain point uh, the, the sphere the, that's emitting the smoke is leaving our box and then the box is delaying down to nothing. Uh, that's uh, because we haven't got the box set up to follow a source. So here, when we're looking at our bounds, we can see that we can check both the density of smoke that's being emitted, and we can also use a tracking object. And I'm going to use a SOP object to track, and of course the object I want to track is that moving sphere there, which is already selected. So what we should now see is that this box always stays around the sphere. If necessary, the smoke at the end of the sphere here is being cut off because the box is, is getting too big. Now, in fact, uh, what I'm going to do is lay down a gas dissipate node. And a gas dissipate node is a node which allows us to reduce the amount of gas in our simulation, the amount of smoke in our simulation, every frame, as if it was evaporating. So I'm going to attach this, I'm going to merge this in here to uh, the end of our smoke solver, which is the steps that take place after the solver has happened. And I'm just going to set an evaporation rate. And I'm going to evaporate by subtraction. And let's give it quite a high level, let's say 0.6. So what this does is every second it, it takes 0.6 off our smoke. May, this may not be enough, in fact, because the smoke... No, we can see the smoke is still evaporating. Let's take it uh, up to, let's say, 2. Let's have a look at that. And that's getting a bit better, but we see it's still the box is still cutting it off. Let's take it up to, I don't know, 10. Right, now we can see that it is indeed evaporating fast enough that the smoke box doesn't cut it off. I'm going to actually take that down, let's say, to 7. And let's increase the bounds here, maybe by a couple. There we go. So let's have a look at this. Okay. I'd even be able to reduce that a little bit more. So let's take this down to four. There we are, that looks good. Well, there are still a couple of issues uh, with this simulation. Uh, one of which is a typical problem with a moving source. And we can see it here. We're getting these repeated patterns in the smoke being emitted. And we're getting these patterns because, in effect, this sphere is stamping out smoke. It's not a continuous stream of smoke. It's being evaluated at each subframe and emitting smoke. And that's what's creating this, this sort of regular pattern here. Uh, and that's not very natural, of course, in real life. This would be emitting a continuous stream of smoke. Well, there is a tool in Houdini 12 that lets us tackle this. So let me go back and have a look at our sourcing node again. And if we have a look at the Scalar Volumes tab, we can see that there's a tab called Motion Blur. And this allows us to construct our volume that's being used to emit smoke 
from the position of an emitter over several frames and blur them together. So I'm going to switch, in fact, to visualizing this, turn off the visualization of temperature, visualize this as a slice. Let me go back here. And in fact, I'm going to change the slice to be in the YZ plane. There we go, because this is moving in this direction. That'll give us a clearer view. So let's say we're going to blur over three frames. And let's take three samples. And let's move through. Well, it, it looks as if our, our source is exactly the same as it's been before. And, and indeed, we're still getting this problem of these recurring patterns in the smoke that's being emitted. And the reason that that is happening is that our sphere, sorry, our create uh, density volume node here, the fluid source node, needs the motion to be happening at the geometry level. It won't be able to look outside here at the animation that we've got applied to our sphere here at the scene level and work out how to do the motion blurring. It can only blur motion that's happening here at the geometry level. So somehow we're going to have to get that motion in to our uh, geometry here. Well, the easiest uh, way to do that, in fact, is to lay down a geometry node. Let me just do that here. And let's call it emitter. And I'll re rename this sphere animated. And inside the emitter, let's delete this. Let's lay down an object merge. And then let's merge in the sphere, the animated sphere. And let me make sure that it's transformed into this object. And now what we should find is that the animation is happening at the geometry level. And we've achieved that because this emitter object has no animation whatsoever here at the scene level. So any animation of this object has got to be happening here at the geometry level. And by using the transform into this object, we're ensuring that that animation is brought in. But we need the smoke solver, uh, the smoke, the conversion into a volume to happen here in this emitter node rather than here. So let me just remove these notes, I'll cut them, and then let's paste them here into our emitter node, and then I'm going to just join this up. And for the moment, let me just view this object, hide the other objects, and we can see now uh, that we're getting proper and proper uh, motion blurring. I mean, it's not very blurred at the moment, uh, but we can see that we're getting several versions of our sphere. And that's because it can now detect the motions. So I can increase the number of samples here, like this, for example, to 10. And one of the reasons, by the way, that this is looking so poor is because we're using an emit from surface. Uh, so I can turn off the empty interior here, and now it looks rather smoother. In fact, I can probably reduce the number of samples down to, say, five, and that's still looking pretty smooth. Now, if we go up to the object level, we're getting this, this completely white screen. Uh, the reason for that is that the Auto.network is, of course, now looking in the wrong place for the source. So we need to go on to our source density from sphere node here, and we need to choose our new source, which is emitter out density, and accept that. And let's have a look now. I pull back so that we can see this. And we can see as we step through this, we now have 
uh, much better, smoother emission. It's looking slightly odd because of that that reduction that we've got programmed into the gas dis gas dissipate. Let me just try reducing that further to see whether we can eliminate that slightly odd. Well, there we are, but we are getting now a decent emission. Well, part of the reason our smoke is looking slightly odd, slightly unrealistic, is that it's inheriting absolutely no velocity from our moving object. And we've already covered uh, one way of adding velocity. So let me go to our emitter. And uh, that, let's move to the velocity tab. The way we examined earlier was to use this add velocity node here. And that would allow us to add a fixed velocity in, in one direction. And we can also add some curl noise. In fact, let me do that. Add a bit of curl noise. And I'm going to scale it right down, just, just make it very small. And then let's have a look and see what that looks like. Turn off the display of my emitter. And in fact, probably turn off the display of my sphere. And let's see what that now looks like. That's got a little tiny bit of motion. Not very much, to be honest. Let's just increase that, perhaps. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, there's a bit more there. The other thing we may want to do is to inherit the motion of an object. So uh, we can do that here on the Object tab. So if I enable this, by default, it's looking for this motion at the scene level for this very object. So by default, it's going to look up here, have a look at our emitter node, and see whether there's any animation on here. Now, of course, there isn't. So we're going to have to look at a different node. And of course, we're going to want to look at our animated sphere. So that's now going to inherit the motion of our sphere. So it's going to, as you can see, rush forward like this. Now, in fact, that may not be uh, what we want. Uh, we could, for example, tone this down so I can scale it back down. So let's take it down to 0.4. And that would then mean that our this seems to have frozen for a second. Let me just uh, see whether I can... I've managed to step it forward. There we go. Right. Let's try again. And that's producing slightly less smoke. Uh, slightly less of that, that issue. There's another way uh, to affect the volume, which uh, to affect the velocity rather, which I'll demonstrate now. And that is to add uh, some velocity attributes to our sphere. So let's have a look at our sphere, uh, which is here. And what I can do is use a point sop to add some velocity. So in this case, let me just display the other objects. In this case, our sphere is going to be moving maybe in that direction. So relative to our sphere, we probably want to have some velocity, say, in the Z direction, thrusting the smoke outwards. So let's go onto our Particle tab, Add Velocity, right-click, delete the channels, and let's give it some motion in the Z direction. I'll give it for the moment just a value of 1. And what this is doing is, if we have a look in a details view, creating this, this V attribute. So now when we come into our emitter, uh, we can see that 
uh, we can in fact now collect a, the source attribute and use the stamp points node here to create the volume velocity. So let me just take away the object motion and let me take away the curl noise so that we can see it properly and let me make sure we're visualizing this go back into the emitter and make sure we're visualizing the velocity there we go so let's have a look at this in fact uh, I also want to turn off the visualization of density so that we just see the velocity so we are getting that velocity that is that is coming out now and I can scale it up here like so and that's going to give it a bigger scale and this will thrust that smoke backwards so let's have a look and see what this now does so zoom out and what we should see is that's going to thrust the smoke backwards rather than forwards and we can it's a bit hard to tell but we can see the the smoke is bunching up at the back here so that's a bit more realistic let me increase that value say to 30 let's see what that does and that's looking pretty good now actually and i'm going to add back some curl noise and in fact I'm going to give it say a value of 5, let's, let's try quite a big curl noise and see what that looks like that's breaking it up a little bit more than I would like so reduce that down to say 1.5 And that's looking pretty good. You can tweak the curl noise and so on to get what you want. So that's the basics of how to use a moving source and how to correct the, the problem of stamping through the use of motion blur. How, if you want, to add, uh, to, to get your smoke to inherit the velocity of the moving object and how to create arbitrary values on your object in this case this these V values that we created uh, to push your smoke out in a particular with a particular velocity when it's emitted I should just uh, refer briefly to this stamp points method you can see that the only method for transferring velocity attributes on points is stamp points and the key stamp points parameter is this sample distance here which allows you to determine how far away from the point a velocity is inherited so if you increase this you're just going to mean that more of the volume will have that velocity given to it not just the places in the volume that are near the points that have the attribute So let's look now at how we would emit smoke from a particle network. And I've got a simple scene set up here already. It's got a particle network, a light, and a camera. We're looking through the camera, which is pointing directly down the z-axis. And if we have a look inside our pop network, we're taking a circle. We're emitting from the surface of that circle 150 points all at once and then we're giving them an upwards velocity with a little bit of variation and then adding a force which is dragging those down I'm using a limit pop with a box here defined as you can see so that it's at zero on the on the, it's on the ground plane here and any particles that hit this box are going to die on that collision and then I've just added some drag to make it a little bit more realistic. And we can see here 
our particles blowing up really quite like an explosion. So we want to use this as the source for our smoke. So if I want to create some smoke, I'm going to need a smoke container. So let me control click this to lay down a container at the default position. And I'm going to raise it up because we're not in fact going to be emitting any smoke below the ground plane here. Uh, and then I need to use this tool here, sorry, this tool here, the source from particles tool, or the source from points tool rather. And this has been a bit temperamental in this early version of Houdini 12, so we'll just see whether it works. Uh, so with nothing at all selected, sure I've got nothing selected, I'm going to select this tool, source from points. I'm going to select our points from our pop source, press enter, I'm going to select our box, press enter, and it seems to be creating a problem. So what I'm going to do is pause the video and then set it up as it would appear if the tool was working correctly in this version of Houdini. When I've now set up uh, the scene as it would be had the shelf tool worked. And we can see that it's added some nodes here to our, the end of our pop network. And unlike the situation where you're just emitting smoke from an object, in this case uh, we have a node here which is creating a density attribute. So it's just a, an ordinary attribute called density on our points with a default value of 1. And then when we go into the fluid source node, which we're familiar with, uh, we're using the stamp points method. Uh, earlier on we were using the build SDF from geometry method. Now we're using stamp points. But we can see there isn't really uh, very much in the way of density here. And the reason for that is that by default, the stamp points method has a point sample threshold. So, in other words, it needs to find eight points within the sample distance in order to register some density. And obviously, when we're using a, a particle system which doesn't have that many particles, it's not going to find eight points. So, if we're not seeing anything, one of the things we can do is reduce the point sample threshold to one and that makes sure every point is accounted for. Now I could have done something else, which is I could have generated the volume from the SDF. And this again uh, allows you to make sure every particle is taken account of. But essentially what you're doing here is instancing spheres with this radius onto each of your points and then generating an SDF from them. Uh, and there's a disadvantage to that, which is it doesn't take account of the value of this density attribute. So I'm going to stick with my original method, because I do want to take account of the density attribute. Uh, let's just have a look, first of all, what this looks like. So remember, this is just the source. We're not seeing here the smoke. We're just seeing the source itself, and we can see that that, that eventually disperses. And I'm going to add a little bit of variety here by animating this density attribute. So let me start off here at uh, frame 0. I'm going to out left click this. We're going to give this a value of 1. And then let's go up somewhere around here, maybe frame 47. And let's give this a value of 0. And again, out and left click. So this is now animated. We can see that. We just go into the channel editor, right click and drag this across. We can see this value is declining like so. So there's going to be less and less smoke emitted as the particle simulation goes on. And we can see that here because we start like this and then we fades out here. There's very little smoke being emitted as this goes on. 
let me uh, make sure we're visualizing the velocity here on the fluid source node just to show you what that's doing so have a look at the velocity this is also using standpoints now remember by default a particle system will have a velocity attribute on it so we should be picking up that velocity let's visualize this yep. and we can see that that is indeed happening and we've probably got some curl noise added here which is why we're getting uh, this variation in the velocity I've, I've switched that on earlier there we are but that that gives us a slightly simpler view but let's leave that curl noise on and let's have a look at what this looks like when we animate it uh, let's just delete that which was from an earlier example so our autodop network contains the familiar nodes exactly the same nodes that we saw earlier so we've got the resize container we've got uh, the source here and this is identical to the source that we had before the source node that we had before so if we have a look here we can see that this is indeed emitting smoke looks pretty good like so and it is indeed inheriting the velocity which is why we're getting these streams of smoke going out now we might want to add some blurring here or some divergence in order to make this center of the explosion a bit more interesting so let's have a quick look at how you would do that so in fact all I've done is to add a gas dissipate node here and instead of using the evaporate by subtraction that I was using earlier on I'm evaporating using a just a straight evaporation rate here so that 0.8 of my smoke will disappear or 80% of my smoke will disappear after one second and I've animated a bit of this so that we can see it so here let's have a look and see what this looks like rendered at frame 15 now one of the issues uh, with the smoke solver rather than the pyro solver is that there isn't a link between the visualization here in the viewport and the rendering so in general our smoke will look more dense when rendered and we can see this now as I render this out and we can see this starting to render let me pause the video briefly while that that finishes rendering so here we are this is the final render of the smoke being emitted from particles